edition of Conversations with Lothrop. I'm Richard Lothrop, and I will be your host for the next uh, few minutes while we visit with a distinguished guest. And we're delighted you could be with us this evening. Our guest tonight is uh, John Mullaney, who is the executive director of the Nord Family Foundation. And he came on that job in 1998. And we're delighted to have you with us, sir. Thank you for inviting me. I'm happy to be here. Tell us a bit about your background. My background? Yeah. Where did you grow up? Yeah. Go well, to I, college and that sort of thing. That sort of thing. Well, I, I grew up, um, I think I'm still growing up, um, but I did most of my youth yeah, out in, in suburban New York, mm -hmm. um, a place called Huntington, New York. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was in high school, my parents had moved to New Hampshire. I then decided that it might be good to go to school in Boston, so I did university in Boston, stayed there, uh, did graduate work uh, in Boston, wound up staying there for quite a long time, um, did some graduate work as well at uh, Georgetown in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. um, and I've really lived all over the world, actually, um, in both professionally and um, kind of domestically as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, what did you do before you, vocationally, before you came to the North Before Family I came to the foundation? foundation? Well, I've had several jobs. Um, most of my career professionally has been at universities. Um, I was at Harvard University for probably too many years, um, doing work, um, one running a program for scholarships, working in Latin America and doing uh, development of Latin American universities. Um, later went to work at the Harvard Institute for International Development doing research on public-private financing uh, programs internationally. Um, most recently was uh, heading up an organization in the Boston area that was using satellites um, to do, uh, low earth orbiting satellites, to communicate with um, libraries and medical schools, primarily in Africa but other places in the developing world and providing them with uh, medical literature, usually mm -hmm. peer-reviewed medical literature was, mm -hmm. that's not available in, uh, very readily to many of these libraries. Mm -hmm. So you came out of New England to come? I came out of New England Harvard. to come to, to Oberlin. Uh, did you at Harvard, did you live in Cambridge while you were there? No, we lived in Dedham, Dedham, yeah. Massachusetts, mm -hmm. which is southwest uh, of the city. I read city. yesterday, I guess, that the president of Harvard is retiring. And did you know him at all? Oh, I had met him a couple of mm. times, but I'm sure he knows a lot more people, a lot more prestigious people I, than I, me. I didn't know whether <laughs> he got your permission to retire or anything of that sort. I, no. we, we consulted no. before. <laughs> what uh, made you decide to come to Ohio? To Ohio. Well, what was about the Nord family? Well, I had a, as I said, I had a job where I was doing, most of my work was university-based, but a lot of it was international. Mm -hmm. So I spent too many time gathering frequent flyer tickets on British Airways, going with a stopover to London, but oftentimes uh, I would fly to Nairobi, to uh, Mali, um, Senegal, um, and you know that was all very fun and very interesting when I was in my 20s and even part of my 30s. Um, but once I was married and had a family, I, it was becoming very stressful. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember coming home one time from a trip and my wife Barbara was holding, I think, our oldest son, Aiden, and I was gone for about 15 days. He had had a growth spurt and I, didn't, I thought she was holding a neighbor's child. So it was that time that I thought, well, it's time to be moving on yes. and looking for something a little closer to home. <laughs> yes. And thought, wouldn't it be great to be in a position where I was back giving out money rather than always looking for research dollars and the mm -hmm. like. And really just cast a um, CV, a curriculum vitae, out and saw an advertisement for the Nord Family Foundation and thought, hmm, this sounds interesting. I think I'll just throw a resume that way. Mm -hmm. And the rest was history. And the rest was rest history. Was history. Mm -hmm. um, and what, you live in Oberlin, I believe. We yes. live in Oberlin. And what, uh, was there anything that particularly attracted you to? Well, my wife works at the college, okay. and she was working at an independent school in Dedham, outside of Boston, had done a lot of work with language labs, mm -hmm. um, and I think there were three labs in the country that were doing what she was doing. One was the Noble and Greenall School, where she was working, mm -hmm. the other was Harvard University, and the third was Oberlin College. Mm -hmm. And just about the time I accepted the job with the Nord Family Foundation, there was an opening at Oberlin College to work the language lab. And, uh, Wonderful. 
So it just seemed very serendipitous mm. and uh, providential that all of this would happen at the That's same wonderful. time. Wonderful. Let's um, talk about foundations and one particularly. Uh, would you define for us the term foundation? Foundation. Well, um, foundation is really kind of a unique entity. It's a it's a um, it's a place where um, it's, it's really a repository of money and funds. Um, in the case of most foundations, this is an opportunity for um, either a community, as in a community foundation, or a family, as in a family foundation, or the board of trustees of a corporation, as in a corporate foundation, to really be stewards of money and really have discretionary sense of where that money should be going. Um, it's the tax structure makes it that way, because if those tax structures were not in place, the government would take it and the government would do it anyway. Mm -hmm. So um, in this case, a family foundation is when a certain amount of family wealth or largesse is put into a, um, a portfolio and managed, um, and, um, and the trustees of that foundation really work with the staff to decide where that money can be best spent and how the money could be used to leverage the greater good for the community. And there are different kinds of foundations, there are, of course. And this one is a charitable foundation, is that right? This is a charitable foundation. In fact, um, there are private operating foundations, which are, I won't go into the uh, tax um, language on that. It could really bore the audience to bits. Um, but a foundation is essentially a, a charitable organization, um, really charged with using dollars charitably for the benefit of the community. And again, there are different federal kinds. and state laws that guide some of this. Oh, yes, yeah. Um, for example, um, <clears throat> the federal government requires that whatever the value of the amount of dollars that are in the foundation. Nord Family Foundation has a corpus right now. Well, on a good day, um, it's up to about between 85 and 87 million dollars. The federal government requires, by law, that um, the foundation and trustees spend um, at least 5 percent of that corpus to give that out to the community, mm -hmm. um, which our trustees certainly do. In fact, our, our spending rates are usually far more generous than the 5% mm -hmm. bottom. Mm -hmm. And that could fluctuate then depending on how the market is and so forth that's right. for, for the investment. Right. Well, the actual amount that's paid out will depend yes. upon the, right. the performance of yeah, the market. That's what I, yes. Yeah. Okay. Now, before the Nord Family Foundation came into existence, there was a parent foundation. Right. Wasn't there? Right. Tell us about that. Well, it's a wonderful history, um, and it's really tied to what I've found to be a, and I think this community knows more than anyone else, a rather unique family. Um, it's kind of really a jewel in American culture. But I, it was really founded by Walter Nord and Virginia Nord, mm -hmm. who were Eric's parents, Evan's parents, uh, who lived in Oberlin. Um, Walter had a company called U.S. Automatic, which in 1952, um, established that a certain amount of gross profits should be spent and given back to the community. I believe that company was an Amherst. That was an Amherst, right. right. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I think the problem was that in good years, the payout was, was great. In poorer performing years, the, the payout would go, go lower. So I think, as I understand it, Walter was looking for a way to have more consistent payout, so established a foundation that would have, be able to pay out um, a certain guaranteed amount to the community. I think at the time it was worth about eight thousand mm -hmm. um, dollars. I think in 1958, um, with uh, Nordson Corporation, um, U.S. Automatic Foundation became the pass-through for the profits of the Nordson Corporation. And it was really about 1988, uh, upon the death of Virginia Nord, that part of her estate went to form the corpus of what is now the Nordson, uh, Nord Family Foundation, and that was really what caused the, um, the distinct entity to be created. Mm -hmm. Nordson Corporation still has its own corporate foundation, which mm -hmm. gives very generously in Lorraine County and, and other counties as well. But the Nord Family Foundation really evolved into something that was very much um, at the uh, creation of the family themselves. So where you had one, now you have two foundations. Well, um, there, there's the Nordson Corporate Foundation, which is, has its own board of directors, and then there's the Family Foundation, which consists, prim uh, we have 12 trustees, 
nine of whom are family members or descendants of Walter and Virginia Nord, and three of whom are from the community. Mm -hmm. And do these two now do different things? Well, they're, they're different missions, um, and, but we do an awful lot of uh, coordination and communication with Nords and Corporation. In fact, we'll, we'll do joint funding on, on many projects in our portfolio. Mm -hmm. And let's see you. Let's talk about the purpose specifically of the Ford Family Foundation. Charitable trust, we've said that, worth quite a lot of millions. And I believe you have certain areas in which you will give uh, funding to. Uh, and I wrote these to see, tell me if you think I'm right, if I'm right on this. I think I've found four. One was health and social services. Got that. Civic affairs. Very good. Education. You're doing marvelously. Arts and culture. You're brilliant. Oh, wonderful. You got them all. Oh, got them all. And then um, I, I jotted down a few. For example, in the, under health and social services, an example would be a grant to the Childhood Center, the Early Childhood, early childhood Center. Yeah. yeah. Um, That's one of the jewels in our yes, crown. Yes. It's a great place. And one in Oberlin. It's a jewel mm -hmm. for Oberlin. Uh, civic Affairs, the Zion Community Development would be one. Yep. Uh, Sunrise Properties, Sunrise a new properties. one, fairly new one. Mm -hmm. um, OHIO, Historical Organization. Mm -hmm. uh, education, I think Eastwood School would be an yes. example. It has money. It's funded several programs, yeah. Uh, the Open Black Alliance for Progress. These are just some. That mm -hmm. I, uh, the Open School District. And one that intrigued me, the Oberlin Youth Soccer Workshop. Uh, yes. That interested me. Was, uh, having, uh, Want to hear about fumbled, that one? Fumbled around when I was about 14 uh, with a <laughs> soccer, soccer team. It didn't go anywhere. I'm sure. Uh, Tell us about that. That was a difficult one for me because um, I kind of coach soccer in Oberlin soccer. And that, the, the intention of that particular grant is that um, is kind of working on the Oberlin soccer um, program. But so it was a program that, you know, it's a great thing. You get parents to come out with the kids. The parents have conversations on the sideline. It's just a wonderful turnout of the community. But what we felt is, though, you know, maybe there weren't enough kids able to play um, with that uh, program. So what we decided is to throw a little bit of money at it and offer some scholarships because it does cost money to register the um, families. And a lot of the families in this community can't afford this the $45. In Oberlin, in Oberlin this yes. Oberlin this is okay. restricted to Oberlin. Mm -hmm. A lot of the families can't afford to pay $45. And so what we offered was a, an opportunity for, you know, if you want your child to play, money shouldn't be an obstacle. So let's talk, and if you need some money, we'll do that. There was also a summer camp program available where they um, bring soccer players from the British Isles over and oh. teach kids some ball techniques and the like. And again, it was very prohibitive for most people to have their kids uh, play. Mm -hmm. So we offered a scholarship program with the intention of getting as many kids in the Oberlin community out playing soccer to bring the moms and dads out too. And how's it working? It's great. It was good. a great program. We're going to do it again this good. summer. Good, good. <laughs> it's a summer program then. Yeah, yeah, well, it goes through the year then too. Have... Then under arts and culture, I came up with the Mad Factory. Yep. Oberlin Choristers, Black River Theater Project, which I think is Oberlin College yes. connected, mm -hmm. uh, Northern Ohio Youth Orchestra, and then the Early Childhood Center again in that category. The Kids somebody. Smart Program mm -hmm. is great, yeah. And I mentioned these just to give our viewers a, an idea of the scope of what this foundation does. And I was also intrigued with something else. I noticed that the grants in 1999, I was looking at the annual report, and the smallest one I could find was $750, and the largest one was $375,000. Right. I was just a marvel at this range. So that raises the question, how do you decide how much, and what is it, is there an average at all? No, there's no, it's a good question. Um, there's no average. What we like to do is, um, well, first of all, we don't like to hold court. Um, and we really want to be a foundation that is very much in tune and responds to the needs of the community. And mm -hmm. I think too many foundations think, well, we have the money and we will maybe deign to hear you and invite you to hear, uh, have, have a hearing and we'll decide whether you're worthy to have this grant or not. And that's not our approach at all. Mm -hmm. um, I meet with people 
all over and love meeting people in this community in Lorain County because it gives a great opportunity of hearing what the needs are. Now, when you hear the needs, you can see that, for example, you know, a $750,000 grant um, on our portfolio looks very small, but you know that uh, $750 is going to have an incredible impact on the lives or the quality of the service that that particular organization might mm -hmm. provide. Mm -hmm. So if it's a good project, it's really creating value and having a great impact on the community, we'll fund it. Mm -hmm. Same as you said for the $375,000 projects, although I admit that we're a little bit more harder on our grantees and do a little bit more scrutiny on grants of that size. <laughs> I was just interested in the wide range of yeah, yeah the, well, this, it may be small, it may be big, it may be in the <coughs> middle, it seems to be everywhere. We're yeah. open to hearing any good idea. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other thing is, I think we ought to mention is that this isn't necessarily given just to Lorraine County or no. Oberlin. There. Mm -hmm. I think South Carolina, Colorado, I believe there were some grants. Right. The bylaws state that <clears throat> um, any descendant of Walter and Virginia Nord. Um, is eligible to part is a member of the foundation and is a, and as a member of the foundation the foundation is able to give grants out to the um, those geographic areas mm -hmm. <coughs> so we do do a good funding in in South Carolina in Denver um, in Washington DC in Boston area now where there are many Nords um, but um, they, the trustees did make a policy and we stick to that policy of keeping about 75 percent of the grants in the Lorain County area um, so that there I think was some talk at the time when I first came in here oh is the Nord Family Foundation going to be moving well no we're here to stay mm -hmm. um, the, the advantage however is that we've done some wonderful grants in the Denver area for example one place called the Conflict Center a remarkable woman who deals so well with communication in organizations and groups and uh, we have this woman, Liz Lozier, will be coming out actually this summer um, to be working with people in Lorain County, actually with the Center for Leadership and some of the um, schools, to work with some of the kids and deal with how do they communicate in the schools and how can we lower the level of conflict in the school. So it gives us an opportunity to do best practices and share those best practices among the different areas where we work. It's a great job. So you really have an opportunity to go and practice in any direction you want to go, don't you? On these? As long as with, it's within the guidelines right, and, and, and there is a mission end. statement that we okay. constantly reflect back on, mm -hmm. and, uh, which is broadly stated, but um, it does provide us some guidance. Is that revised occasionally <clears throat> um, as the years go by? Or? Oh, we, we look at it pretty much every year, and um, fortunately people agree that it's a pretty good, solid mission statement. and mm -hmm. we, Follow through, but we do. We, in it. fact, we're having our board meeting in June, and we're going undergoing a self-evaluation and a self-critique of how we're doing as a board. Mm -hmm. So, uh, is there a monitoring process? Let me tell you what I mean by that. Mm -hmm. You give out, let's say, somebody gets a group gets fifty thousand dollars. Let's say, do you monitor how that's spent? Is there a yeah. feedback? Is there an evaluation process so you know that this is? working or it isn't working or oh yeah each grantee when they receive a grant <clears throat> have to, uh, to sign an agreement that says that at six month intervals they will report back to us with a written report of how how things are going now in many cases i've been on the other end where i've had to write reports and oftentimes you'll write what you think the donor wants to have you say um, and w so to complement that we keep a lot of very close contact with our grantees, um, who I prefer to call our colleagues rather than grantees, mm -hmm. um, but work with our colleagues to keep communication and do a kind of qualitative as well as quantitative mm -hmm. analysis of how things are going. Mm -hmm. And that works pretty well then. Okay. I think it does. We, cert we take them very seriously, and if there's a problem, we'll talk with folks about mm -hmm. it. Um, not to castigate, but look for ways to um, improve and let's see where, how we can make it better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And are people usually pretty receptive? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Particularly if they want the grant renewed, obviously. They're you even more be, receptive. Yes, yes, yes. yes, yes. <laughs> That's the old saying, money talks, or something like that. Right. Uh, let me ask one more question, then we'll take a quick break. Okay. Um, I think you partly answered it. Uh, I was going to ask if the foundation trustees periodically evaluate the criteria. So for giving, yes. For giving, and they, they do. do. And they do. 
and uh, is there ever a discussion of basic philosophical changes? And I think you've answered that, that they look at it, and so far there haven't been. Well, I have to say, this is an absolutely wonderful family and group of people to work with. They're all extraordinarily intelligent. They take their work very seriously. Um, I've compared trustee meetings, though, similar to Thanksgiving dinner, mm -hmm. where you kind of bring the family together, hope for the best, and not knowing what might happen. Uh, but usually, I can say every meeting we've had, people leave um, feeling as though um, we've had good discussion about issues, we've covered the issues, and the grants that we've made are, are made very responsibly and very seriously. That's, um, that's splendid. Uh, well, uh, and it, would this, is this basically how most charitable foundations you think would operate? With criteria, mission statements, criteria is well, I think that, yes, them. and I think that uh, most of them do have mission statements. They have a way of functioning that's very similar to the Nord Family Foundation. Mm -hmm. You had an earlier question of what really impelled me to, to move to Oberlin, possibly even take the job with the Nords. And aside from being a wonderful family, um, you know, I did some homework. Um, moving to Ohio was a pretty daunting proposition, mm -hmm. and in the process found that you know, the Nord Family Foundation does have a reputation of having gotten it right um, from the very beginning. And mm -hmm. I get phone calls many times from other smaller foundations asking, how do you do it? Mm -hmm. um, what did you, you know? So it's, um, I think that most foundations operate the way we do. We're certainly not perfect. Um, but I think a lot of organizations do look to us for guidance on how to structure their own. A lot of new found found foundations that are coming about do call us uh, occasionally for some advice. And, and I, I think somebody once said something to the effect that when somebody copies you, that is a rather good accolade to receive. Form of flattery, yeah. Yes. Well, I had nothing to do with it, but yeah. uh, it's <laughs> nice to be in the, in, yeah. the, in the flattery. Let's take a quick break, sure. and we'll be back in about a minute. These days, the media seems to move faster than ever. No sooner does something happen than the TV cameras are there covering it. There before almost anyone else. Almost. Please support the American Red Cross. The need is real. The time is now. Help can't wait. back. Our guest tonight is uh, William Mulhaney, who is the executive director of the uh, Nord Foundation. And uh, we we'll have been having a very interesting discussion here, and we're going to ask two or three more questions. Sure. Uh, I would be interested to know about the process of grant applications. Let's say that I want to, uh, I have something that I'm doing it, I think would be deserving. And I want $100,000, so I think I'll go to the Nord Foundation and see if they'll help on this. Mm -hmm. What do I do? Well, walk me through it. Charming as you are, we would not be able to give you $100,000 personally. Mm -hmm. I couldn't get that 375. No, no, I'm afraid shoot, not. Not even shoot. a lunch at the Java Zone would oh, do it. Dear, oh, you have dear, to have right. a 501c3 tax <laughs> status. You have to be an org, a okay. recognized organization that has tax status with the with the IRS. Um, that um, uh, so assuming that the organization has this. Um, they can do one of two things. They can um, phone us up and say, you know, I'm thinking about this kind of a grant request, or I have this kind of project. Is this within your guidelines? Is this something you'd like to do? And our conversation would be, well, you know, send in an executive summary. Let us have a look, and we'll talk about it. Um, so that's an option. Um, alternatively, people will just send in a full grant request, having read our guidelines, having read through the annual report, and judging that this might be something that the foundation would like, they send it in. 
<coughs> our grant um, cycles are three times a year, August 1st, um, December 1st, and April 1st. So you have to meet the, the guidelines or the deadlines to get your grant in. And once those grants are in, we sort them out by program area, and we begin to read through them very carefully. Yeah, excuse me, do you have an application form? There's no formal application no form. form, just a guide, that, you know, okay. give a brief summary, get into the pith of the project of what you're going to do, let us know how much it's going to cost, give us an overall budget of what your it costs to run your organization. And uh, uh, so I, there are two program officers that work at the foundation with me, and we divide up the work among the program areas that you discussed earlier. Um, and we review them. Um, we not only review the grant request, but we'll go through all kinds of things that are now available on the internet. LexisNexis has a um, search mechanism to look if, if there's anything on this particular foundation. Are there similar projects like this foundation working? Um, we'll go out and do a site visit. We'll meet with the people who have submitted the request. We'll look and see just get a feel for the place. Mm -hmm. um, and then we come back, and that's when the hard part begins, because we've had <clears throat> a remarkable increase in the number of uh, grant applications. Um, I, from what I understand, about 10 years ago, it was mm, almost one to one. For every grant request that came in, a, a grant was, was given. And maybe that was a little too generous. But um, right now, we have, for example, um, in this round, if we keep our 5% payout, we give out about $1.2 million each round. Mm -hmm. Our grant request this round was exceeded $5 million, which means we have to do some very heavy cutting, um, which is difficult because mo the majority of the projects that we get in coming to us are, are good projects and certainly a benefit to the community. So then we really have to fine tune it down, do some research and due diligence and see what we think um, will be approved by the trustees. Now, what happens is, the, let's say that I have my 501 and everything, 501C, I guess I guess. Right. Is. But I didn't make that, I don't get a grant. Right. Am I, can I be in the pool for the next round, or do I have to start it a It depends on what your $100,000 was for, and, and it's really a question of, you know, if, it, if it's a really good project and it just, you know, it just didn't meet it this year, there's probably a good reason why it didn't. Mm -hmm. So that would mean, after those other grants are done, I would more likely than not phone you up and say, let's have lunch um, and talk through and see where, you know, how you need to shape this or hone this where it would have a better chance. Now, the next round, you might get $50,000 out of the 100, mm -hmm. but we would have talked through where you might be able to get the other $50,000 from the community. Mm -hmm. That's a brief rundown of how it might work mm -hmm. to do a grant request. Uh, and... Uh I guess you answered the question, how many applications do you get in a year? And that's mounting each year, is it's it? going up each round. Um, People recognize a good thing. I guess so. I don't, I don't well, I think probably the needs are I think the needs are too. expanding tremendously. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we do see you know, like cluster areas. For example, very curiously, this round, we, we have seen a large number of requests to uh, renovate playgrounds. And those requests have gone from $750 to do some tidying up of a playground to, I think, the largest one was $100,000 to do a playground. I think there are six or seven on the docket this round. Um, it we must be what they call being in this year. It's, I, something it's, it's the it's thing in that's year. in. The Playgrounds thing, are in. Thing this right. year. <laughs> uh, technology is always in and mm -hmm. getting inner. Mm -hmm. um, we get a lot of requests for hardware, computer hardware, and the like. Mm -hmm. um, Unfortunately, we see a lot of an increasing request to support programs that deal with alcohol, child abuse, mm -hmm. um, uh, spousal abuse uh, in families, uh, and and so those are the tough ones to have mm -hmm. to respond to. Mm -hmm. Some good ones too, some very good ones, some very innovative programs on fathering, which I particularly mm -hmm. like. Mm -hmm. So, uh, going back to the application, you spoke about there not being an application per se, form per se, and in a way that's good because doesn't that give you a chance, if you were making an application, to expand creativity Absolutely. in your presentation, mm -hmm. which in turn helps you? Right. You want people to yeah. talk it through, and if that means talking it through in a typewriter, that's okay. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, uh, application forms can be too restrictive and you can miss too easily the, the essence of what that particular grant is, mm -hmm. is like. And, and in a highly competitive 
era, it's too easy to say, you know, they wrote an executive summary, filled out our form here, didn't make it, and cast it aside. When you realize, gee, you know, maybe this person doesn't know how to write grants very well. You know, or, you know, you could, so a longer form gives them a chance to express themselves and might pique our interest to go out and take a closer look. Do you, tra you travel then to these places? Oh, sure. Do you go to Denver or would somebody out there handle that? We, shared, we shared the geographic oh, areas among yeah. the program staff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we'd like to get out. And that raises the question, how many people work for the Dord Foundation? Well, Family Foundation? there are two program officers. Uh, there's a financial officer and there are two administrative assistants. So we're up mm -hmm. to about five. Mm -hmm. Then you keep busy. And me, and me. We keep very keep busy. busy. And you labor where? Where is the... Uh, the offices are in Elyria, uh, across from the Midway Mall and Midway mm -hmm. Boulevard in an mm -hmm. office building over there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Easily accessible. Uh, and people are finding you. And people are welcome right. to come by any time they want. Mm -hmm. That sounds wonderful. Just call ahead. But <laughs> Let me ask a um, general question here. Let's think about charitable foundations for a moment. Mm -hmm. Where do you see them being in ten years? Well, then we can bring it to the Nord Foundation. But let's let's start out generally. Do you see? I'm, I'm thinking in various ways: tax laws, demands of the public for needs. Uh, yeah, um, great question and very topical. I was at a. Um, conference not too long ago um, of foundations and there was a presentation by a man named Paul Shervish at Boston College who studies philanthropy trends and came up with an astonishing figure of almost a trillion dollars will transfer of wealth. Uh, there will be a trillion dollar transfer of wealth from one generation to the next over the next 20 years. So if you take just a small portion of that, one can assume that because of the tax structures of having to, to give it out, you, there will more likely than not be an, a rather large increase in the number of foundations um, that come into to play. Um, I, I have no way of estimating how many it will be, but you see phenomena like the Bill Gates Foundation, a lot of these foundations that are starting on the West Coast mm -hmm. as a result of the phenomenal increase of money that's um, in wealth that's being generated out there. We call them the dot-com foundations. Mm -hmm. um, so I suspect you'll see more of that. Uh, Brian Frederick at the Community Foundation has been working with uh, people in Europe to uh, help set up foundations in, in Europe. Um, tax structures are different there, so it doesn't, hasn't had the same environment, but I suspect in the future you'll be seeing more uh, foundations functioning similar to what we have in the U.S. in the European mm -hmm. scene as well. But you don't see the structure changing that much of a, of a foundation in 10, 15 years. There are some changes. I mean, there are some foundations, particularly some of these West Coast foundations, that are taking a more hands-on approach. We'll give you the money. Um, it's their philosophy, a nonprofit organization. We see, you know, the assumption is that somehow nonprofits aren't quite professional like the business world. So we will not only give you the money, but we will give you our expertise to help you run there. That's a level of micromanagement that's come under a lot of question um, in the foundation world. And I think you'll see um, that there'll be a retreating from that um, and more alignment with what traditional foundations have done in the past. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How many foundations are that are like the Nord Foundation, or the Family Foundation, are in this area now? In this area? Well, in Lorraine, Lorraine County, County. Or maybe Cuyahoga County. In Lorraine County, um, well, I can't, sp I should be able to know that and uh, speak to that in the Cuyahoga County, but I can't do that. Um, I know Grant Makers Forum of Ohio, which is the statewide foundation, uh, kind of group, Association for Foundations, estimates there are about 2,800 foundations in the Ohio, in the state of Ohio. We did an interesting study in Lorain County not too long ago with Brian Frederick from the Community Foundation, Constance Hawk from Nordson, um, uh, Jane Norton, and then Ellen Brickmont from Stalker, mm -hmm. and some of the other, uh, and uh, Sister Catherine Lee from the Sisters of Charity. Those are among like the four or five large foundations that fund just in Lorain County. So we did a retrospective study of three years, how much money has gone out in Lorain County among these foundations, and the figure came close to $20 million, which for a county of 290,000 people is an astonishing amount of money, mm -hmm. and I think demonstrates that Lorain County, although it kind of fits a kind of sense of like this Midwest, Farm Belt, uh, Rust Belt community, really has an extraordinary number of 
very generous people in this county that are very concerned about supporting the community. And that, I think that's unique. That twenty million will probably go up gradually as the years. Go. I suspect it will as these corpus build. Uh, the corpus builds. I know that the community foundation has goals and expectations to exceed their current corpus of I think about seventy-five million is what they're up to now. Mm -hmm. But I suspect that will grow as well. Mm -hmm. So, so, do people make duplicate applications? Might I say, ask for fifty thousand from from, one from you and fifty thousand from say Stark or something else? Oh yeah, to get I mean, some of that. Oh sure. Like college applications. Uh, Absolutely. I mean, <laughs> and, uh, and do you have any kind of clearinghouse where you know that there? The grant has gone in somewhere else. Or well, do you we'll, ask for the or a request. Or yeah, I mean, it is a bit of a. It's a. Um, um, People do write grants. I think that, again, Lorain County is unique in that we have some very good people working in the leadership and the foundation world, very accessible. We'll talk with the colleagues. We'll often make suggestions to a grantee, you know, you know, we can come in but ask Stalker because I think that Stalker might be interested in complementing this particular grant or um, same thing will be from Stalker. They'll call us and see if we might be interested in helping to support a particular project. So we have a good communication among ourselves. And I think that uh, that level of communication and honesty, not only among the grant, uh, directors, but even with the, the nonprofit community, um, takes the game playing out of it. Because okay. I think there's a te big tendency to do that kind of game playing mm -hmm. that you're talking about. And I think we're avoiding that uh, right. in the community. It's just being honest with people. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I'm hoping they'll be honest with you. In yeah, return. and I yeah. think they, for the most part, they are. And in a way, I suppose the county in this area is not so large that you probably would hear about it if, if somebody was yes, uh, in fact, not being quite above board. Yeah, many of our, my colleagues from the Cuyahoga and Cleveland area have often said they enjoy the funding that they do in Lorain County because they really feel they can wrap their arms around it and get a sense of how things are going. In Cleveland, it's so big, sometimes things just get lost. Mm -hmm. um, well, we're just about at the end of the show, and let me ask one final question. And that's, do you have any final comments? No, but I notice that these cups are awfully nice. Okay, and we're going to give you one. Of those. Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> uh, and we're going to give you one that doesn't have, have water, water in it. it. <laughs> because we did one time, we had a little mistake there. But this is a cup that. Uh, we give to our guests conversations with Lothrop and Cup and the chairs, uh, the symbol of it. And we do that, and we thank you so thank very, you much, very for much for being our guest tonight. It's thank been you. great fun and very, very fun informative. Fun for me, too. Good. And we thank you all very much for having joined us this evening. It's at the end of this season. Believe it or not, this is the 55th program that we've had. It seems a little hard to believe, but it is. And we thank you for your support, and we hope we'll be back in the end of September. Uh, for our next series. So until Cheers. then, uh, this is Richard Lothrop saying thank you again for joining us. Good evening and have a great summer. <laughs>